My name is Jared Heal. I'm from the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. Um, I'm a mechanical engineering student. I got a physics degree though from Carroll University, which is in Waukesha, Wisconsin. And I'm here to present my topic, a different approach to the industrial design process using integrated bitmap trajectory plotting processed using manipulator robotics. And I'm really excited. Worked really hard. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say my, I would express my uh, appreciation to this university and uh, uh, Stout, it's beautiful. Um, with the National Science Foundation grant for giving us the opportunity with such great mentors in all aspects of this research. Special thanks to Dr. Devin Burr for his time and support and being a great mentor. And then also um, thank you to Mr. Cross, which he was supposed to be here um, today. Um, he's a person I worked with. He's an industrial, he graduated last semester in industrial design at this university. So it's good to have some um, feedback from um, this university as well. And he wanted to jump in um, with my project as well. And we worked kind of one-on-one -on -one and uh, we bounced ideas off, which later in this presentation, throughout, the, or excuse me, throughout this presentation, I outlined his design choices and the beauty of his renderings. So my project statement and kind of a background and some facts. Um, the conventional industrial design process today involves an industrial designer drawing a multi-perspective drawing that will eventually make it to an engineer or himself to be drafted up in CAD, and he doesn't have that feel aspect in the draft phase. Um, products are conceptualized and built with the consumer in mind, therefore its revisions are critical, and especially in an ever-changing market, um, being up to date with the current um, whatever is being brought to market is very crucial. Um, some facts that kind of brought me into this and why I kind of like it and kind of a background approach is that there's more than 40,000 industrial designers in the United States that's just in the profession alone. Um, a lot of them, um, approximately 1,500 uh, are in the design business and it's about a $1.4 billion industry. Uh, approximately one third um, are self-employed, so they have a lot to do on their hands. Um, <laughs> And it's, more four t and it's four times greater than the self-employed rate of all United States workers. Um, this was kind of an interesting fact. Michigan, Rhode Island, Wisconsin, Indiana, and Pennsylvania are at the top five states by percentage of industrial designers in the workforce. And it's, and it's projected over um, the next decade. A growing number of those industrial designers will need to um, find work in, the, in another pro uh, professional services or kind of uh, move up. Uh, because there's such just a high demand uh, for this work. So kind of, uh, I kind of showed this slide earlier. I'm kind of bringing it back to life in perspective. Um, this company, Architectural Services and Consultation, um, did a study um, where they got a whole bunch of, they got, they got some people together um, and they tried to sketch out different shadings and drawings and techniques that you can do with a pencil. Um, there is quite a few. Um, you, there's landing, there's stroke weight, there's um, hatching and shading, and there are different techniques that you can do to describe a perspective into a drawing. And from there, they wanted to bring it to life and to elevate um, a projected field from that sketch or from a 2D plane. And they were trying with multiple different patterns of how to achieve, it, uh, achieve a sort of a figure in so a sense. Um, and then here they kind of show different um, pixelations and how when you blow that up it um, shows like the pixel density and how many of those are close, closely related and then it shows the projected height field as well. So uh, once again uh, they, they say in their words that it's an array of tools from physical to digital, 2D to 3D. Um, is utilized to test notions of rule-based design, techniques of projection, and graphic strategies of line weight, hatching, and shading. And then they place emphasis on rigorous and inter process of translating ge ge geometrical information from one media to another. So I did a case study, and um, me and Mr. Koss um, came up with some ideas um, that we thought maybe would be practical. And actually, it was kind of interesting. Vanessa, you should have came forward. Uh, I would have liked to have seen your design thrown into my program, which I'll show later. Um, I think we could have we could, we could have came up with something kind of neat for that. 
uh, for the design. I like that like box shape. But um, uh, so kind of in the, the Japanese uh, language, they use kanso, which is simply or the elimination of unnecessary clutter. Things should be expressed in a plain, simple, uh, natural manner. This reminds us not to think in terms of decoration, but in terms of clarity. So we kind of just took everything and we kind of just omitted um, just over the top fancy because we want, it's supposed to be a, a cocktail napkin kind of sketch where it's kind of a square rendering that we can take, capture it, take a picture of it, or uh, scan in 2D image of it and build an elevated height field, which I'll show coming up. So he, we came together, he, he kind of drew this outline. It's um, in his photo album he gave me, um, which I'll show. He will we'll outline the process too as we go along. Um, it's called the Homework Reminder Keychain, and it's supposed to be a keychain for high school students. And they wanted something where it was easy to to wear or clip on, and wanted them to kind of remind um, students of when they have homework and at what time it needs to be done and stuff like that. And they showed different. He showed like different backpacks or positions that you could uh, you could attach it to. And we have different methods that we came up with as well of how to. Uh, there, there was a bracelet bracelet design, um, a, a, a necklace design, and so we wanted to kind of see which one was the better one. And, we didn't know, we didn't know the visual space that we were working in. So that's why I kind of wanted, that's why I came up with this, with this design and I'll show you as we step through it, um, what the power of this can do. So here was his uh, bracelet design. And through this program, it's a, it's a uh, library through C++. It's called uh, tin, uh, Cinder++, uh, which is a whole library of the visual bit mapping. And uh, you can do a whole bunch of other really cool stuff with it. And I worked, and I, uh, depending on how that pixel density is with uh, the different line weights, we can uh, elevate um, trajectories based on that, and we can get um, we can get a surface meshing. Uh, this wasn't the one that we ended up going with, but I just wanted this is a, a good photo to kind of show height elevation from a, from a ground surface up, and also kind of the field we're working in, and. The farther you get away, uh, the more depth of field you get to as well. So it's, it's working by mapping out each individual pixel to a reference point. And this is kind of a blown up kind of image of it. So we have a whole bunch of dot fields in, uh, in a 2D plane um, that's, that's elevated. And this is a, a a representation of uh, X and Y. And as we can see, as the pixels get closer and closer together, um, it means that there's a lower change in elevation or it's much flatter. And as we get further out, there's a much greater elevation change. And this is really zoomed in. Um, so I zoomed out a little bit more and you can see how many data points we're working with. And as they get more darker, you can uh, we use a lot more line weight to show density and a, 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 a more a more subtle curve within the within the figure. So then, what we did, what I want, what I'm, what I did was I tried connecting these points into a mesh. Um, so if we have all these data points, we mesh them together, we get a a uh, two uh, D con con curve of the the image. So we're not the goal here is we're not trying to design a whole the whole surface the whole final product. We just want a representation of the outer shell of of the image, which I'll show in a couple slides. Um, this is just kind of what's going on underneath um, the surface of the object. So here is a, his representation that we ended up throwing in, and this was the, the kind of the final one that we ended up going with. And then uh, kind of representing that, he kind of told me it was a Fugen, if I can say it, Fugensai, which is an asymmetric or irregular, irregularly um, kind of shape. The idea of controlling balance and composition uh, via this asymmetry. So we didn't want something completely, totally um, 
we wanted something unique that kind of was a visual pop out that kept something with that would stand. Um, but it has a very unique shape that it's very easy to uh, clip on and it won't get lost easily. Um, one thing that we thought with the bracelet that we that we kind of steered away from was that with this you can put it on more than one like a backpack or you can put it on um, a purse or something without um, just being limited to wrist uh, mobility. If you were to go to the bathroom or something, you put it down, maybe lose it. So here's what's going on at the surface. So we took, we took that kind of final image, we blew it up, and at this corner, um, we're creating a, a surf, a surfage, um, where it's kind of overlays the, over the top, it's kind of overlaying on the top of the skin of the surface. And you can see here, this is this part is actually the MATLAB version of this corner right, right around, right around there, and it's the the curved surface, and it's meshing all those points. Now there's a lot of points here. Um, I was trying to I was trying to shrink them down, and that's one of the things I kept I kept going back and trying to revision. But the, um, once you shrink an image down, or you try to take the the pixel density, and you try to suppress it in a way, um, you lose a lot of that detail, which is, which is vitally important to how the program builds the image. Um, and then we can see here, here's the, two, here's the 2D rendering of the surface of, a, of this, because this is a round, if you can visualize this, this part is flat, it rounds around this corner and it comes back on the other side, and then this Part is an ex is a cutoff extension on the other side of that. So this is a surf the surface part of the of the image. So it, it's got it's got lines going vertical and horizontal, and then it's got stitching in between. But as you can see, I'm working with a lot of data points, and that's one thing I was really trying to limit and try to work under constraints. So kind of how is, how is this all tying together now? So I kind of came up with an idea to have a desktop uh, robot that would, this is the dynamics of the robot or the range of motion of the robot. And I tried mapping out all the possible points I can. There's more points in here. Um, this, this, pretty much this whole circle it, or this whole radial uh, trajectory is, is acceptable for a build space. So it would scan an image and then it would build out that surface plot um, using a, kind of like a 3D printing kind of esque way of where it uses the hard resin uh, filament. And I kind of just wanted to show all the di different dynamics that it could possibly hold. Um, and I'll go through the, the build of it actually in the next slide. But just kind of going through that, there's an input. So you have so you you have that napkin sketch, that cocktail napkin sketch. You scan it, um, there's a dynamic response from the robot, and then it gives that uh, system feedback. So here's kind of the build. Here was the first kind of gen, and then kind of a, a, a model showing the intricacy of how it actually it kind of all comes together. So there's a base for it. There's two motors. There's a motor cap, which goes over the motors and holds the, everything into place. There's a, a, a gasket, or there's a, a, there's a ring that uh, is free to, is fixed to move um, and pivot around um, the, the base. There's the gear system. There's uh, a base plate. There's a gear, uh, it's, a, it's a long cylindrical, cylindrical rod that raises the Z height elevation of the extrusion head, and then there's the uh, the cap or the the body of the of the, the robot, and then the arm. The arm is is uh, to, is disclosed or is not. It's this is supposed to be a static kind of a figure, so it's not proportional to what the final desired value of whatever you want the, the build to be, because I. The object is um, still under debate in how to scale that. 
So, And then here's some of the robot dynamics that I wanted to go into and more about how that surface meshing kind of works. And then I also have a video of how it actually building so you can actually see it. But I'll step through each one of the different uh, photos I got here and also what's going on in my MATLAB code. So on my MATLAB code, I specify all the dynamics of the robotic arm itself. And I gave it um, weight, I gave it uh, motion, I gave it um, base coordinates, and I gave it um, each of the, I measured each of the plastic weight uh, for what I thought was an acceptable design value for each of the, the arms. And uh, it has inertia in there, and it's outlined in that table. Um, so as it's gonna as it's gonna build, which I'll show in a second, um, here is a blown blown up blown up blown up version of uh, of that height field that I have. It stitches all those together and it labels each one of the points. So if there was an error, it would come up with an error for each whatever point system you have, and then it message me message meshes all those points together and it has a overlaying surface which um, is is all the black with the dots and then underneath it, I'm not sure if you can see it really far back, but there are little gray um, points that you, or there's lines, little gray lines underneath, showing the underneath layer, um, which might be kind of hard, but good there. Um, so now I'll kind of show, um, uh, I use the ro low resolution uh, capture uh, capturing things so it's not showing the full it, it actually is a pretty fluid motion but I it was using a lot of data in my PowerPoint so I had to reduce it okay and now we come to the, the product vision and kind of what we took away and kind of what um, how his vision kind of compared to my vision, kind of how we kind of summed it all up. And so I, I asked him without even looking at my vision and uh, what I would process, if he would just come up hypothetically with some uh, images that he thought would be a final product for it. And this was a, a bracelet that he, did, that, we, that he kind of came up with using styrofoam, poster board, and putty. And then um, this is uh, the keychain that we used. But as you can see, it goes through multiple, multiple different um, processes. And um, that's kind of one of the things that we can take away is that it ends up not being even what I thought would maybe be his, he would have designed more towards this aspect. It actually, the final product that he told me after two, two weeks. The projector shut off. Just pause a second. Uh, which he actually then made out of plastic was this model, and so it's a lot more refined and it's. Um, but having that validation and having making sure, especially if you had a client that you were trying to come in or trying to get that feedback, and also if there was something already that was hitting the market as you were drafting this up, that needed revisions like on the spot. Um, something that you could easily do without having to spend a lot of time or money. And this is kind of uh, a typical process of, from concepts to what I call uh, hitting or out the door. Um, and everything with, a, with an X or with a cross through it is something that I wouldn't eliminate, but I would try to, uh, to shrink or minimize. And especially if you're doing this with a small team of people, you, it would really be beneficial, it, or even yourself. Um, so having that concept um, to the draft, and then I don't know if you, you're going to have multiple meetings, and that's kind of why I have it in a triangle. And then you have to go on to the uh, artist rendering, and then a budget, and then you have the pitch, and then uh, you go to a prototype model, and then CAD. But sometimes then you go back, um, depending on what, if the budget or the sales don't go right. Um, also with manufacturing, if you're manufacturing large amounts of these products, you got to take into consideration what's the cost and how, do you, how to reduce that. And maybe if they can cut something out or modify it, and uh, then, we, then, we hit the, then, we, then we ship it in, bag it up and put it out the, out the door for multiple people to use. 
Um, and then something kind of that sums this kind of all up is Shibuya uh, or Shibumi, which is beautiful by being under, understood uh, or by being precisely what it was meant to be and not elaborated on. Um, I think we can take that away because if it's too confusing or if it's the product is not precisely pitched in the right way, it might get some negative connotation or feedback, um, which is what we're trying to minimize. And then here's um, some of my works and wherever I've been, um, sources from and articles and where today is at in the market. That's, I mean. Well, is this question now? Yes. Uh, what, what is that robot for exactly? Yes. Um, it's to implement the, so once you scan the uh, image, you want to see it being built or elevated. And that's the way of bringing it from a concept to an actual physical, tangible model that you may be able to show a client or something. Or 3D printer? In a way, yes, but it uses, top, it uses a surface meshing. So it doesn't have all, the, all that detail below. You're just worried about what's going on at the surface. But yet, it's still pretty strong. Um, with that image that I showed multiple slides back that you can really get a really tight knit mesh of that outer surface. Now I wouldn't use as many points. Um, if I could eliminate a lot of those points or reduce them, that would be optimal. Um, something maybe I can look into a little bit more. Um, right, so it's, so it's a 3D printer that just prints the shell of the object in the Yes. Okay. Why? That's a good point. Um, this is because it, you can, it's a, one, first of all, it's a desktop um, machine, so you can have it right next to you. It eliminates that um, having to, you have to build the draft CAD model for it in order to 3D print it, or at least in today's right now. So if we can get something where you can get a cocktail napkin sketch of it, where you can just purely aesthetically just draw it physically out, and you can see that and kind of uh, manipulated in a way, because it is a, it, they are parts. Um, you can always go back to the drawing before, board before you hit it, before you actually bring it to a CAD physical model where you're actually taking a lot of time and building that. Um, how long do you think you could, the uh, robot would take from like end of drawing to like finished 3D mesh? Like for for the program wise, actually the the program spits it out relatively quick. It's just the conversion from all the data points that I have now to MATLAB that um, there's a there's a bit of a miss miss uh, communication. Is that um, is that due to like just processing power? Or? I I don't think so. It's I think there's a lot of extraneous points because if we look in the model, there's um a lot of flat region and I tried what I tried doing was I tried cutting out all the zero implements for it um, but it left a lot of holes um, where it was trying to divide by zero and it, it thought it was trying to it was trying to then mesh those back around again and so that that was uh, another slight hiccup but I think it's eventually I, I see it for for future where it might be very possible where um, a, a, something like that could be implemented. So when you're like, kind of when you have that point cloud and there's all those little points and yes. comes together, so those seem like they're like really close from, you know, you have to zoom in. Yes. Like what, what kind of accuracy would you expect uh, the robot to need to be able to uh, precisely? Well. Like I said, that's a great point, and I I would eventually like to reduce the the number of data data points that I was that I was. I think it's because when you take that image or the picture, it has such a high res resolution to it <laughs> that that's where the the problem lies. Um, like you like I said, I was trying what I was trying to do is I was trying to there's programs you can do you can scale it down you can take a hundred percent image and you can reduce the pixel density to 
ten percent, but you're losing a lot of those debt. You're losing a lot of those data points that if you just somehow took a smaller image image res of it, um, it was, no idea what my computer is doing. Sorry. Uh, if you could take a smaller, just uh, that's why I was thinking about maybe using a lower res camera or something. Because if you could just ha if you could just take that square better photo or whatever scanned image. Um, but have that resolution. I think that would solve. I would think that would solve a lot of the issues. So when you when you were speaking about the uh, uh, cocktail napkin, you started with an actual physical drawing, or did you yes. start with a digital drawing? Or could you start oh. with a digital drawing and, and maybe alleviate some? We used both actually, um, but yes, we did start with the the pencil sketch drawing that I sh that I outlined um, before. But you can are you you're I'm assuming you're referring to what it's called a Wacom or it's a digital. Uh, you know, to, to bridge that gap with your uh, pixelation issue or or, or with the pixel. Or you know, essentially um, uh, bring the pen into the considerations of the drawing. Yeah. Let me see if I'm getting, uh, so you're, you're saying that if it was automatically, if there was a large, maybe I'm sorry, I'm not understanding what you're trying to say. You said you had some issues in terms of translating pixelation by scanning an image. Yes. So I'm saying if you go like a monochromatic situation might be easier, or if you just look at what kind of pen is used mm -hmm. to create an image, so you can control that image a little better. So, oh, so you're saying like a number two pencil versus a... Uh, a pen, for instance, yeah, they're actually. Uh, that's actually a very good point because um, with a pen, you get very different results with um, if you use a pencil over a um, a fluid ballpoint pen, for instance. Um, and that's the one thing was that we try to stay with the number. A lot of this was done. That was done in a number two with the number two pencil because you get those kind of those breaks or you get those those chalk those chalk lines where you get landings and. Um, it's when you take when you put the pen on the paper and then you you draw it and then you lift off you get uh, you get a tail end or a streak and so a lot of those do come into um, into play but uh, a lot of the data points that those would it just automatically throws out so if they're small and minute it can just throw those out so uh, in the future do you envision taking this concept and then In terms of application for individuals with disabilities and their service, um, one of the things that we work very hard to do is, is to try to uh, minimize the amount of travel people need to make to come to us to visit us in laboratories and mm -hmm. instead taking the services out to the field. So you were saying that you know, the vision is to have something, um, let's say desk, desktop, right? Um, could you envision this actually taking it a step further so that it'd be well, there was also uh, that's actually a very good point you brought up. There was a uh, some articles, and I was also talking with a a professor here who we described or we, we described which that students that maybe can't conceptualize three D spaces that well, but they have a great app or they they know have a, a great extensive drawing skill would be able to convey those kind of in. Uh, what they're trying to say, or they want—they just want to see what they can, what they can produce. And going from those, it would be a great learning tool in that aspect for um, schools to kind of bridge that gap and maybe kind of see, um, or shed some light into kind of uh, 3D um, modeling in that aspect. And also, it was also interesting because there was an there was an article where um, this kind of surface meshing with um, 3D printing in a, in an essence. Um, would also create, also if you could get that meshing too, would create um, like skin graphs. And you could build, or you can make um, those kind of, would be kind of interesting too. Um, there's also with, you, we were also talking with how many data points and accuracy. Um, we're not only, in today's technology, there's not only just 3D printing that's available with just plastic. Um, now we're getting to a lot of hard, liquid resins 
and I think you can be able, you can eventually, or even now, we can get a little bit more accurate with that. And uh, I think if we could build those kind of meshes underneath and kind of have an overlaying surface, that would be really cool, and have a no, numerous amount of applications as well. Thank you.